There we go. And I am going to move out of the way and I'm turning this over to Ellen. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you, everybody. So the, the topic of the Camden Conference this, this year, as we all know, is Europe challenged at home and abroad. And there are many ways to uh, meet challenges. And for some people, one of the ways to meet a challenge is to write a poem. And sometimes the resulting poems can be challenging in themselves. Uh, there are many quotes about poetry, and one I especially like is by Anna Quinlan. And what she says is that most of us experience poetry as the heart coming around the corner and unexpectedly running into the mind. <laughs> so maybe we could all think about as we listen to the poems and people's commentary, what happens to our heart, what strikes us and what we think about what's in our mind. For me, looking into contemporary European poetry was very enlarging, and I hope it is for you as well. Uh, the first poem makes a very strong connection with last year's Camden Conference, which uh, many of us were at. The topic was the geopolitics of the Arctic, and the first poem very much relates to that. And our first reader, Dr. Susanna Hancock, has a lot of experience with that. Uh, Susanna is a specialist in Arctic climate geopolitics. Her chosen poem by Nils Aslak Vukeapa, known as Ilohash, I may be getting some of this not exactly right, uh, is in Northern Sami, is particularly special to her as she used to live in Sampi near Volkayapa, Volkayapa's hometown, where he remains influential 20 years after his death. Additionally, Howard Gasky, a translator for this poem and presumed to be the last person to speak with the poet, is both Susanna's former teacher and friend's Father, Susanna. Excellent, thank you, Ellen. So yes, as Ellen said, this poem was fun. I didn't choose it, Ellen chose it and offered it to me and that was fun, fun to see. So this is uh, a section of Trekways of the Wind by Niels Oslak Valkyapa. And it is known as my home is my heart. I will read it and then say a couple things about it. But the section from this poem is possibly the most known of all works in Sami literature that have gotten around. So it's quite a famous piece. My home is my heart. It migrates with me. The yoik is alive in my home. The happiness of children sounds there. Herd bells ring, dogs bark, the lasso hums. In my home, the fluttering edges of parkas, the leggings of the Sami girls, warm smiles. My home is in my heart. It migrates with me. You know it, brother. You understand, sister. But what do I say to strangers who spread out everywhere? How shall I answer their questions that come from a different world? How can I explain that we cannot live in just one place and still live when we live on all tundra? You are standing in my bed. My privy is behind the bushes. The sun is my lamp. The lake is my washbowl. How can I explain that my heart is my home, that it moves with me? How can I explain that others live there too, my brothers and sisters? What shall I say, brother? What shall I say, sister? They come and ask, where is your home? They come with papers and say, this belongs to nobody. This is government land. Everything belongs to the state. They bring out fat, grimy books and say, this is the law and it applies to you too. 
What shall I say, sister? What shall I say, brother? You know, brother, you understand, sister. But when they ask, where is your home? Do you answer them, all of us? On Skolfa de Ieva, we pitched our lavu during the spring migration. Chapu Vuatmi is where we built our guati during rut. Our summer camp, Zitunyarga, and during the winter, our reindeer are in Dalvados. You know it, sister. You understand, brother. Our ancestors kept fires on Ala Orda, in Sorfiegas' tufts, on Vitas Chiaru. Grandfather drowned in the fjord while fishing. Grandmother cut her shoe grass in Shelgasrotu. Father was born in Finubakti in burning cold. And still they ask, where is your home? They come to me and show books, law books, that they have written themselves. This is the law and it applies to you too. See, here, but I do not see brother. I do not see sister. I see nothing. I cannot. I only show them the tundra. So, yeah, so give a couple, couple minutes of response to this. So as I said, this is a section of a longer piece. And if you look in the book as it's written, I think it's spread over about 24 pages and it has a lot of imagery and the words kind of dance around the page to give the impressions of the reindeer on the tundra. But it's basically the classic story of a conflict on relations of nature between sort of a Western owner exploiter approach and indigenous more kinship relation with the environment and a little bit of idea with that of, you know, I don't, don't own the land as much as are part of it. So yes, that penetrating colonialist values that have really sort of prevented a common communicative frame, uh, which ends up silencing the indigenous person. And you see parallels in this poem to two things in particular. One is the 1854 speech by Chief Seattle on the loss of the rights of one's own identity and one's history. Also an epic psalm a yoik, and a yoik is a form of song basically, but much more in sort of a story telling or an epic piece depicting a struggle between a nuaiti and suola, which is basically a, a sheep, a shaman and a thief. So the thief is stealing uh, stealing waters, for example, and as if these are something that are ownable and the shaman is working to sort of maintain, maintain that hope. Um, Nils Athlok Valkyapa was a key person in establishing Sami identity and getting them recognized as an indigenous population, which didn't really happen until quite recently. So he's a poet, artist, painter, storyteller, singer, yoiker, et cetera, uh, quite well known. And the last thing that I'll say in this is that, you know, while something like my home is where my heart is, quite seems quite cliche in English, in Sami, the idea, I mean, poetry is a relatively recent, written poetry like this is relatively recent, and we don't have that same cliche-ness that comes across in English. Uh, but it also sort of portrays a level of intimacy that, you know, that he is sort of speaking to us as, as allies in this. And lastly, because this is true in the English version, this is true when it's been translated into Swedish and Norwegian, the Sami names are not translatable. And that's because they are much more of an embodiment of a place. I mean, they're a specific place, but it's not just the name of a town or the name of a mountain. It's that whole encapsulation of that specific moment, that specific time. And so it's just showing that strength of connection and how place-based and identity-based everything is. So I will stop there and pass it over. So thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Susanna. And, and I, I, I wanna say, yes, <laughs> I wanna say, say something now. Um, 
probably many of us are going to meetings and starting to experience people making land acknowledgements. Um, from, from my perspective, it's, it's a, a fairly new thing. Uh, but in the spirit of this poem, uh, at the Cushing Library, I am at, on the land uh, originally uh, of the Abenaki people. So our, our next reader is Francois Amar, and he is professor of chemistry and member of honors faculty at the University of Maine. Besides poetry, his interests include hiking, biking, baking, and zimurgy. Am I saying it right, Francois? Zimurgy? Zimurgy. Uh, which is applied chemistry dealing with fermentation processes. Francois. Thank you, Ellen. And so nice to be here with all of you. Um, I was not familiar uh, to my great regret with Emmanuel Moses before Ellen gave me this poem. So it's been a real pleasure to experience his work and, and, and uh, deal with it a little bit. So here's the poem called Souvenir of Liège by Emmanuel Moses translated by Donna Stonecipher from the French. What else remains besides time, bare, unchangeable, for us to belabor in unfinished discussions, interrupted by glances out of windows on these autumnal days, reflections of reflections, like the gray pond that has so often seen the little footbridge and a lost fisherman leaning over the parapet, some accidental birds, the halos of the lamps behind the facades of the Rue aux Juifs. The rain that was announced will be spared us today, but not the trembling of the leaves or the dirty light discharged into the city. The silences, they too are unraveled, each word taking on the significance of a call of distress. How to keep, the, how to keep ajar the door that gave on perspectives all azure, the majestic bay where the night collected itself. Lizards slid against the hot stone like so many drops of eternity. And all it took was a seagull to burst the inattention, the dull absence attached to the morning. Maybe dreams will know how to save us. Crowded platforms, trains departing, horse carriages gleaming like brand new. Will we never disappear in the little square of a window for those who remain behind? A room will make our consciences echo with the here, with the now, with the shimmering point at the end of the breakwater that was the entire sea. Um, let's see, I've got to find my, my notes here a little bit. Um, so, you know, Emmanuel Moses entitles his poem Souvenir de Liège, that is memory or remembrance or reminiscence of Liège. But then I'd say his poem wanders like memory itself from image to image, starting with these mournful tones of the low country, uh, a gray pond or a marsh, the last lonesome fisherman, rain avoided, but not the heavy sky. And there's a real sense at the beginning of the poem, there's a real sense of tiredness, heaviness, and loss of purpose. And this line, the halos of the lamps behind the facades of the Rue aux Juifs, I guess I could say a lot about that line, but I would, I'll just say it's not an accidental choice of street name from this Jewish, French, German, Polish poet who was born in Morocco. Uh, he comes back to the silences, which unravel in a kind of mirror version of the unfinished discussions of the second line. And then suddenly there's this huge change in tone, a, a, a very different, sunnier, maybe more joyful image of an azure sea, a hot sun, uh, how to hang on to this? How can it save us in the parting that is enacted on the train platform? Is that travel by train past or future? Uh, he asks if the face in the window ever really disappears even as it sh shrinks from our sight. Um, I'd say the last three lines appear to really confound all consciousness, the here, the now, the present, the past, uh, and the future in this sharp point of memory which is some kind of blinking light at the end of a seawall or breakwater that marks the end of land and holds the entire sea. 
uh, I think there's a sense in which this poem tells us that life is held in memory and that it's not linear. Uh, I feel this poem is very much in the romantic tradition, uh, this sort of sense of as it, is, as it is above, so below, as it is outside, so it is within. And, and the emotions follow these images and landscapes. And here they're all swirling around at once. Um, I'd say the voice of the poem is very much that of an observer who seems passive and inserts himself or us very sparingly with the word nous or notre, we or uh, our, only three times, notably in the first line and near the end where he wonders if we can be saved and with the mention of our consciences. I will say Stone Cypher's translation adds this first person pronoun one more time when she translates uh, the lines in French, disparaît-on jamais dans le carreau d'un vitre pour ceux qui demeurent en arrière as will we never disappear in the little square of a window for those who remain behind? Rather than using the third person of the, of the French, does one ever disappear in that pane of glass for those who stay behind? So she's, she's sort of emphasizing the, the person or the narrator a bit more perhaps than the poem does uh, in French. I'd say this is a pretty difficult poem. It was difficult for me, lots of cuts and breaks, tricky punctuation with a kind of run-on quality that for me sort of added to that conflation of past, present, and future. But I really love that it ends on this sense of wholeness in the last two lines. In French, du maintenant de ce point, scintillant au bout de l'estacade, qu'était la mer tout entière, which I translate as, and of the now, of that glittering point at the end of the breakwater that held the sea entire. Thanks. Thank you, Francois. Nice to hear some French. Uh, Marjorie Arnett is next. Marjorie's a studio artist as well as a published playwright and poet. Selected as one of Pennsylvania's artists of influence, her experience includes professor, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, teaching at the Academy of Art Zagreb, Croatia, a painting writing residency in Versa, Italy, and an artist in residence, Obidos, Portugal. Am I on? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to read the poem Saison de Cour by Claire Joie. She is a, a Swiss poet born, in, uh, born September 8th, 1971 in Switzerland. If I had loved better these days with their good smell of bark, these copper twilights, the mountains exposing their toothless jaws, if I had walked more upright along trails that lead toward dawn where faith shelters us from doubts and time. If I had known how to savor the full laugh of the river that rocks in its fleece of leaves, my head held to the trunk's pillow, my cheek cast, my cheek cast amidst time. If I hadn't fled like a coward to the back streets and believed in the false lights of the city in its burning waltz of noise, perhaps I wouldn't stumbling rake my wooden head against the walls of night. My response. <laughs> what I tried to do and hopefully managed to do as I read Cezanne de Cour again and again over the last weeks, bring the poet's quiet, familiar, almost intimate vision to this focus. I found this poem to be deceptively effortless poem and I would um, guess not very much was changed or lost when Ellen Hinsey translated from the original Swiss language poem into English. The apparent simplicity of the language of this short poem, comprised of three stanzas, stanzas, negates its complex, compelling depth. The first line of the opening stanza, if I had loved better, begins the thread that moves us through the poem by her use of the simple word, 
if. If is used three more times in Claire's poem when she writes, if I had walked more upright, if I had known how to savor the full laugh, if I hadn't fled like a coward to the back streets. It's really not an unusual word to use if, and, a po and the poet does not try to keep reflections on her past hidden in any way. She exposes in this translation to English, a trace of regret as if her heart aches because it aches because of the choices she made through the years, choices at those moments and during times when she really was given an opportunity. And if she had just looked up, just been present in those moments, possibly things would be different now in her life. Her use of if works as a thread. We follow as a reader from if to if to if, moving us from the poet asking what if, then she follows her use of if and gives examples of what might, what might have been, if only. I finally realized what she was sharing in this poem. It, it, it took me a while, was that she was saying, I was there many of these moments. I was there, just not aware. It took me a while to really understand that. So now she is thinking back to realize those times in her life offered something she did not even know, things that were being offered to her at that time. I'll put it a very simple way. She was not tuned in to those moments or what we might say in this, you know, she was not present. She says, would I have loved better with the good smell of bark, these copper twilights and mountains exposing, exposing their toothless jaws? or walked more upright on trails, or if I had known how to savor the full laugh of the river that rocks in its place of leaves. Her writing is not disjointed or hard to decipher. Within her poem, there are four ifs, and a thread, as I've mentioned, leads the reader to a two-line last stanza with the first word, perhaps. But before the final stanza of two lines, she does tell us false lights of the city and its burning waltz of noise has been her life. And then the last stanza, which is perhaps I wouldn't stumbling rake my wooden head against the walls of night, almost to say, if only I had known was right in front of me my entire life, for I was offered choices, but I did not look up did not look out through my job, my life in the city and understand what was really possible. I will have to say, I felt as I became so familiar with this poem that I was looking at an old black and white photo of two friends talking, sharing intimate words. One old friend saying to another, if only I hadn't fled like a coward which is one of her lines, her final and fourth use of the word if. There's, always, there's also a little bit of music as I end to this translated poem created by a repetition of the word, of one word, similar to one note played again and again on sheet music. And I have used running like a thread in my words to you today about this poem. If and perhaps, the full laugh of the river might have led her down a different path than through the burning malts of noise. Marjorie, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so now a number of people have mentioned translation and all of these poems are translated and um, by uh, well-known and well-regarded translators. And we have one of the uh, well-known and well-regarded translators with the next poem, um, James Brassfield. His third book of poems from Louisiana State University Press, Cove, is forthcoming in March, 2023. Twice a senior Fulbright fellow to Ukraine, 
He's received fellowships in poetry from the NEA and Pennsylvania Council on the, Earth, on the Arts and the American Association for Ukrainian Studies Prize in Translation and Penn Award for Poetry in Translation. And, and I believe, James, am I right? That it's a book about the, the poet you're going to read? It's a, it's a, a, it's a, it is a selected poem. And uh, this poem, uh, uh, 352 is from, is from that collection. I, I'd like to begin though with a, to preface this poem uh, to give a sense, uh, a greater sense of, of where the poem is coming from. And then I'll finish and, uh, without any commentary. Um, just to give a quick summary of the political and, and social contingencies that shaped Lasseha's mature life uh, and informed uh, his metaphysical sensibility underlying Song 352. In 1972, Soviet leader Leonard Brezhnev began a crackdown on intellectuals. It was the year Joseph Brodsky was expelled from the Soviet Union. And Ukraine, Lesheha, at the age of 23, was, ex excuse me, was expelled from Lviv University. He was studying American literature. For publishing poems and an essay in a literary magazine, the work was neither protest, nor of Ukrainian nationalist sentiment, yet violated official aesthetic and ideological dictum. He was placed in the Soviet infantry and later exiled to Buryatia, uh, located, of course, in southern Siberia above Mongolia. There he was immersed in Asian literature and Tibetan Buddhism. American and Chinese literature and tenets of Buddhism were lasting influences on his life and his work, not engaged in the opposing doctrines of Soviet and capitalist socioeconomic arguments of the Cold War, but Sheha found agency and literary influences in the writings of Thoreau and in the outliers of modern American poetry, Robinson Jeffers and Ezra Pound, as well as in the work of William Faulkner and Robert Frost and in the poetry of G.H. Lawrence. In later years, he was fond of Gary Snyder's poetry. Snyder's Turtle Island was his favorite book. And he was fond of Native American myth, though he would live for many years in Kiev and Lviv. He was most at home in a forest. A question may come to mind is how many poems in, in uh, how many poems entitled songs did Laseha create? Only a very few. Because the Soviet censors banned his work from publication from 1972 to 1988, he wanted the authorities to search for the hundreds of non existent songs. That's born with Song 352. When you need to warm yourself, when you are hungry to share a word, when you crave a bread crumb, don't go to the tall tree. You'll not be understood there, though their architecture achieves cosmic perfection. Transparent smoke winds from their chimneys. Don't go near those skyscrapers. From the 1,000th floor, they might toss snowy embers on your head. If you need warmth, it's better to go to the snowbound garden. In the farthest corner, you'll find the lonely hut of the horse radish. Yes, sit here, the poor hut of a horse radish. Is there a light on inside? Yes, he's always at home. Knock at the door of a horse ladder. Knock on the door of his cock. Knock. He will let you in.
Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Kathleen Ellis's latest poetry collection is entitled Outer Body Travel. She's translated the work of Ecuadorian poet activist Nancy Cerda and Uruguayan poet Cristina Perry Rossi, Rossi, who was exiled in 1972 and lives in Spain. Ellis has traveled widely in the Basque country, Galicia, Galicia and Portugal. Thank you. <clears throat> and thanks for bringing this together. It's wonderful. <clears throat> yeah, yes, it's Galicia. They really, they so, 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 those C's. <laughs> Very different than Mexican Spanish. Um, yeah, Chus Pato, amazing poet. And she is considered to be by many the most radical and important poem in, in, the, Galician, in the Galician literary world today. She was born in 1955, so she um, had to live through Franco's repression. And Franco was very interested in getting rid of the Galicians. So he would uh, try to repatriate these people and send them off into other countries in Europe. And of course, so there was a, a big um, dispersion of them, but um, and also to take their language away from them for a long time, sorry. <clears throat> but uh, she did grow up with learning a little Galician and came back to it later and, and now knows it very well. And Galician is now accepted again in that whole area of <clears throat> Western Spain. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And it's amazing that we have this incredible poet from this, this area. She, um, she writes usually in first person, but she's not a lyrical poet. She is mostly uh, an epic poet. She writes book long poems. And this comes from, this poem comes from uh, a long epic called <clears throat> Charndon, which refers to a, a insane asylum, <laughs> which is uh, the insane asylum where Marquis de Sade went after he'd been in prison in the Bastille. And, uh, I'm, I don't know whether it's the first poem. I haven't read the entire book. I've been waiting for it to show up in my mailbox, but it hasn't come. So I'm new to this. Uh, she writes out of a desire to bring fiction and realism together. And her epic is really about place. It's about the nation the nation of Spain, but about the nation of uh, Galicia and how it is a community unto itself. And it is from a feminist point of view. And she usually writes in present tense because she doesn't believe that, that things are gone completely. She believes that uh, we are living as much in the past as we are in the present and future. <clears throat> She, she has said, make sure I get this right. I belong to an intermediate generation. My parents were native Galician speakers, but always spoke to us in Castilian as they didn't want their children to have painful issues in adapting. Naturally, what my generation inherited from our parents <clears throat> was a linguistic conflict. My native language is the fascist prohibition against speaking the language of my progenitors of the women who preceded me. This is definitely the case, she says. Which brings to mind, uh, and a lot of what she went through, or at least with what um, many people from, from her place, and she talks about place all the time. Place is everything. Place is language, place is culture. She, <clears throat> and, um, and the way that, that um, the Galicians were treated for the longest of times, as were the Basques. Um, it, it sounds very much like the way native peoples in this country were treated as well. So, oh, and, and okay, you do need to know a couple of things. Right. Okay, because yeah. I needed to know. Yeah. A panopticon, right. What is a panopticon? A panopticon is 
is very interesting. It is, let me get to my other page here. Let's take this here. It's a prison and it's a circular prison. And in the middle of the prison, there's a well, which is um, like a watchtower basically. And it swirls around so that it can watch every single one of the prisoners at any time, it goes around and around and <clears throat> they can be observed. And so can you imagine being in that kind of prison where you're constantly under surveillance? So that's what she calls us. And now the panopticon is a ruin. And the, the imagery of ruins come back, comes back over and over and over in her different poems, uh, as well as in many, many people's poems who were in exile. Um, the, the Perry Rossi poems that I translated are full of ruin and the center of emptiness, that, that heart of one's culture that has been lost to you if you're in exile, and in this case, trying to get it back again in Galicia. <clears throat> and then in the third line, it says, if a desert, it'll be a tell. I had to look that one up. So a tell in ancient, in the Middle East was a, a hill or a mound that was composed of the remains of successive settlements, one on top of the other. But it also can mean, <clears throat> it can also mean a sign or an indication, which I think it means both of these things here. And the reason, um, maybe some of you don't know why this would, why this title would be in, in brackets, it's kind of uh, very similar. Sometimes we see this with Shakespeare in his sonnets because they don't have titles. Uh, but in this case, this means this is an excerpt from this larger, longer poem. And now the Panopticon is a ruin by Chus Pato. And translated, her major translator in English is Erin Moore, who is uh, a Canadian from Montreal. And now the Panopticon is a ruin. Never mind, for I can imagine the landscape however I want. If a desert, it'll be a tell. If rich with vegetation, wisteria will grow over the building. If in Antarctica, it'll be a phantasmagoria of ice. Some folks, working women, crazies, school children, poets still live there. They don't realize no one guards them. For in times of plenitude, systems of domination don't pay attention anymore to populations. They don't have to feed them. Just as you were saying, capital is illiterate. I have to get out, exit biology, remain in my body. And I think what you probably notice, and I'll be really short with this, uh, what you probably noticed as you move through this poem is it is full of fragments that don't necessarily seem to go together except for the, where the lines um, do uh, break into the next line. Uh, and we moved from Antarctica to deserts to all kinds of places. And, and then we have those working women, crazy school children, poets. Some of those types of people would have been kept in asylums or in prisons. And then we have the whole thing, the, the uh, political issue of systems of domination don't pay attention anymore to populations. They don't have to feed them, just as we were saying. Capital is illiterate. We're studying Marx right now in, in, um, in uh, honors classes here at the University of Maine. And we all, we all know what capital is. And I don't know whether Marx would do with capital is illiterate or not, he might. And then there's a small I, I have to get out. The small I has to get out. And then we have an oxymoron, exit biology, remain in my body. How do those two things butt up against each other? But always she, almost all of her poems seem to end in this, this um, hope or, or um, fantasy of um, escaping, being free, that, that escape is a kind of freedom. And escaping one's body could be a kind of freedom if it's a body that no longer fits or, or has been hurt or wounded or something. So that's all I wanna say about that really exquisite poem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, interesting two of the words in that last line, exit and remain. Um, okay, next is Wayne Hobson. And in retirement, 
Wayne is active in the Rockland Shakespeare Society and the Camden Conference and assisting his wife, Sharon, who's here with the operations of her nonprofit, One Less Worry. He spent his career as a professor of American studies with a strong interest in the study of public memory. Quite appropriate to the poem, I think. Yes. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> Just a second. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to close the door. We're in, uh, we have two computing computers in the same room, same house, and we may be feedback. I'll be reading Dawn at Auschwitz by Senedin Musabegovic, uh, a Bosnian born in 1970, who is currently a professor at the University of Sarajevo. And the poem was written in, uh, in Bosnian, which is a, a version of Serbo Croatian and translated by uh, a woman from uh, the same area and uh, who, who has a remarkable little discussion of herself as a translator. She says, I'm not really a translator. I just needed to understand this war that he went through, that the, I'm 10 years younger than him and I, didn't, and I don't have the same experience of, of of uh, the terrible conflict in uh, in the late, in the early uh, 1990s, so I needed to read him, and to do that I had to translate him out of my own native language into English. I don't quite understand her logic, but that's how she explained it. Anyway, Auschwitz in public memory is often invoked as a shorthand for the entirety of the Holocaust and the lessons that we need to learn so that it will never happen again. This poem avoids that didactic voice. It is certainly elegiac in the sense that there's a focus on Auschwitz as a place of death. And there are striking images of innocence lost and of yearnings for protection. But there's also a wariness about attaching larger meanings. In any case, I think you'll agree that although this poem is evocative, it is also uh, somewhat enigmatic. We don't know who is speaking, and the poem very pointedly does not identify who died at Auschwitz or how, perhaps assuming we don't need that information, or perhaps for other reasons, and only obliquely gestures toward identifying their killers. It is also unclear whether the poem is an effort to imagine the prisoner's perspective when Auschwitz was a death camp or whether we are reading a meditation inspired by a present day visit, or perhaps it's both these things. Without question, it's a poem about being surrounded by the presence of death. It is also a poem that displays similarities to the tone and content of other poems that Musabegovich has written, particularly those reflecting his experience in the early 1990s as a young soldier in the Bosnian army during the brutal and prolonged Serbian siege of Sarajevo, his home city. In these Bosnian war poems, he speaks in the plainest of language about the daily horrors of sniper warfare and about a normal life suddenly interrupted. There's another important backstory to this poem, which we learn about from an essay Musabegovic wrote about 10 years ago entitled, The Memory of the Dead Body. In it, he examines the politically charged exhumation during the late 1980s of World War II era mass graves in Eastern Bosnia and Herzegovina. The alleged killers were the fascist Croatian Ustasha. However, as Musabegovic points out, the Ustasha had not operated in Eastern Bosnia during the war. So the killings of those entombed in the mass graves were most likely fellow Serbs. Yet it was clearly considered important to identify the victims as nationalist martyrs and to draw sharp lines between Serb and non-Serb in, in, in doing the exhumations. The recovered bones were reburied in accordance with the customs of ancestral faith and contributed significantly to an inflamed Serbian nationalism and sense of victimhood. The idea that members of the Serb nation were the greatest victims of World War II 
and that the perpetrators of the crimes committed against them were members of other nations, in particular Croats. This helped stimulate and justify Serb nationalist atrocities during the 1992-95 war. It's not surprising then that what that uh, Musabegovic, a personal victim of that war, is wary of the uses to which the memory of the dead body can be put. So let me read you the poem. This morning, things have finally, through the shriek of the officer's whistle, which penetrates the cracked barracks boards, whispered their names to us. As I open my eyes, two mice scurry into their hole, frighted by our pasted faces. They twitch their legs and huddle together in the warmth of their bodies on our smells to feed. Images that slip by through the morning haze. The gray dogs pause whose tracks in the snow resemble the dark eye sockets with their gaze turned up to the sky in which white infinity freezes. And the electrified barbed wire which stirred by my movements touches the lines of the sky and the snow in the sounds of the doomsday harp. And the officer's shining badge from which the eagle with spread out wings plucks out pieces of my flesh Enter me like darkness enters a child's eyes. Here, death has no spasm, no twitch. Everything is the same. The sunrise and the sunset are the same, like the lines of the horizon, streaked with rays on the snow, in which I will be laid by my mother's hand that used to touch me in my dream. Only order and firmness exist. I it will be interested in hearing discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you talk about memory. There's also a, a time mixing up of time sequence here with the mother's hands. Yes, exactly. But that's yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the image of protection, yearning for protection, which I think is is right. uh, is an important element here. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, Josie Hughes uh, is not able to be with us today. So we're, we're going to move past letter from the summer house. I do very much recommend you're coming back to it and reading it. Uh, it's another, she's another Ukrainian poet. So our, our next reader is Stephen Koltai. Uh, Stephen is an entrepreneur, former, former entertainment industry executive, researcher, writer in international economics, adjunct professor at various universities, currently MIT, and was first senior advisor for entrepreneurship to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. He lives in Lincolnville, Maine with his husband and Minnie Labradoodle. Hi, thanks. Um, Catherine Grundahl, uh, who wrote The Law is the Mediterranean is a Norwegian uh, woman who is both a poet and uh, an attorney. Um, I, I think it's fascinating that a Norwegian is writing about the Mediterranean and using the Mediterranean as a metaphor, since it's nowhere near there. Um, and it's a it's a very uh, interesting and uh, I think pithy short poem. The law is the Mediterranean. Take long, slow strokes. You're rowing across the strait in one day. Jews, Christians, and Muslims live on each their shore. You think the law comes from the heavens and that the shiny surface of the sea mirrors God, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There is a sea between you. The law ties you together and keeps you apart. And every wave moves the law. Take long, slow strokes. You're rowing across the strait in one day. 
So a couple of brief observations. Um, in Judaism, law is another word for the Torah, um, and the law giver is Moses. Um, this is a, a very, uh, obviously, a strongly um, religious-themed poem uh, that ties together the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of which are joined by the law, which is common to all of them. The Torah or the Old Testament is, of course, part of the religious uh, teaching of all three of the Abrahamic religions. Um, it's it's uh, the imagery tying the law to the Mediterranean, which, of course, is the geographical area in which the three Abrahamic religions um, uh, exist, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, Islam uh, came from further away in Saudi Arabia, but it generally in the Middle East um, is is fascinating, as is the image of rowing across it. Um, and the Mediterranean, of course, is a sea, not a strait. And why um, she refers to it as a strait and not a sea, I think, is an interesting question. Um, and I invite any discussion on any of those points. Thank you. So maybe maybe we're thinking a little bit about some of the uh, with regard to the Camden Conference, some of the issues that that Europe is is challenged by, and uh, certainly immigration, and what what happens in the in the Mediterranean. Um, thank you. Uh, next is Carl Little who is the author of Ocean Drinker, New and Selected Poems. Earlier this year, he was given a Lifetime Achievement Award for his art writing by the Dorothea and Leo Rapkin Foundation. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, thank uh, Wendy Roberts, the Cushing Library and the, Canvas Co and the Camden Conference for hosting this event. Uh, I'm gonna be reading What's Slouching by Zoran and Sefsky translated from the Macedonian by Graham Reed, Peggy Reed, and the author. Uh, but first off, a few notes about Ansevsky. He is a poet, essayist, and translator. Born May 16, 1954, he lives in Skopje, capital of the Republic of Macedonia, which gained its independence from Yugoslavia in 1991. He's professor of the, in the Department of English Language and Literature at the State University and secretary of the Macedonian Penn Center. His books of poems include Lines of Resistance, 1998, and Translating of the Dead, 2000. And Sefsky also edited Change of the System, Stories of Contemporary Macedonia, which came out in 2000. And he's been involved in a, in a mammoth project to, to translate some 2 million books into and from Macedonian. And he's served on that project as a consultant for the poetry section. And I, I like this anecdote um, from a visit Ansevsky made to America when he was a student in the 1970s. While in California, he drove up the coast to visit the poet Gary Snyder. And when he found the house, there was a big party going on with Robert Creeley and Allen Ginsberg and a dozen other poets sitting in a hot tub making spontaneous poems on a blackboard. <laughs> My kind of party. Yeah. Anyway, a few notes on the poem, What's Slouching? And Sefsky uses clever wordplay and snarky humor to criticize the quote, eroded erudites and other well-meaning but perhaps misguided groups in the Balkans. I, I would note the repetition of the word corridors. It's kind of interesting. The poet mentions milk teeth, which are baby teeth. I had to look that up. Medina is a city in Saudi Arabia, the second holiest city in Islam. And of course, the title of the poem comes from Yeats's famous verse, The Second Coming, the last lines of which read, and what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Here is Ansevsky's poem, What's Slouching? 
What's slouching like stagnant air through these Balkan corridors, eroded erudites, plague written rad radicals, communists, nationalists, bloodthirsty ecologists with milk teeth, descending from the national parks with conserved views, reserved for outbursts of tribal passion, Freudian complexes of minimal difference for random reservists, and condoms of all different colors too. Whatever is slouching will never reach Bethlehem or Jerusalem, nor Mecca or Medina, but hurrying and scurrying down different European corridors in Red Crescent or Red Cross ambulances will enter a wilderness of mirrors. In Versailles, where terrible tailors cut out new corridors and a well-tuned verse is reversed to a stammer. Thanks. So we might come back to Versailles. Um, thank you, Carl. Sure. Uh, Carolyn Locke lives in Troy, Maine, and is the author of three books of poetry, Always This Falling, The Place We Become, and the riddle of yes, as well as a reflective travel journal in the style of Japanese haibun entitled Not One Thing, following Matsuo Basho's narrow road to the interior. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I'm having a little internet uh, blip or something, so I hope nothing happens while I'm speaking. Um, so it says my connection is unstable, so we shall see. Um, a Russian poet and novelist and dissident, Irina Ratushinskaya Ratushi, Ratushi, huh, was arrested by the KGB in September of 1982 and began serving a seven-year sentence in March of 1983. This poem, written during her imprisonment, refers to a time in November of 1983 when it took six men to force feed her during a hunger strike. I will live and survive and be asked. I will live and survive and be asked how they slammed my head against a trestle, how I had to freeze at night how my hair started to turn gray. But I'll smile and I'll crack some joke and brush away the encroaching shadow. And I will render homage to the dry September that became my second birth. And I'll be asked, doesn't it hurt you to remember? Not being deceived by my outward flippancy but the former names will detonate in my memory, magnificent as an old canon. And I will tell of the best people in all the earth, the most tender, but also the most invincible. How they said farewell, how they went to be tortured, how they waited for letters from their loved ones. And I'll be asked, what helped us to live when there were neither letters nor any news, only walls and the cold of the cell and the blather of official lies and the sickening promises made in exchange for betrayal. And I will tell of my first beauty I saw in captivity, a frost covered window no peepholes, nor walls, nor cell bars, nor the long endured pain. Only a blue radiance on a tiny pane of glass, a lacy winding pattern. None more beautiful could be dreamt. The more clearly you looked, the more powerfully blossomed those brigand forests, campfires, And how many times there were cold weather and how many windows sparkled after that one. 
but never was it repeated, that upheaval of rainbow ice. And anyway, what good would it be to me now? And what would be the pretext for that festival? Such a gift can only be received once. And once is probably enough. One of the most interesting things about this poem for me is that even in the midst of her captivity, Ratushinskaya was able to imagine a future when she would answer questions about her brutal treatment with positive memories. In fact, it seems she was writing her way to survival. Later in her life, she would say, they can't confiscate your brain. If you allow hatred to take root, it will flourish and spread and ultimately corrode and warp your soul. This poem may be one that helped to save her soul. If she were asked about specific horrific experiences, such as having her head slammed against a trestle or enduring freezing nighttime temperatures, she imagines that instead of being bitter, she will render homage to the dry September that became her second birth. That she will tell of the best people in all the world, her fellow prisoners and the first beauty she saw in captivity. Only a blue radiance on a tiny pane of glass, a lacy winding pattern, none more beautiful could be dreamt. And she will understand how that one moment of beauty helped her to survive with her soul intact. The story of how she managed to write these poems and how they reached the West is as remarkable as the poem itself. She wrote poems on a cake of soap, memorized them, then washed her hands with that soap, removing any trace of writing. She also wrote them down on cigarette papers, which were smuggled out of the prison. She recited her poems to fellow prisoners who memorized them. Her husband, who was living in Moscow, received her poems from others who had either memorized them or had received copies from those who had. He eventually compiled a book of 47 poems written during the first 17 months in her prison, um, first 17 months in prison. The book was entitled Beyond the Limit. It was released in the West in 1985, a year before Ratunshinskaya, before her early release from prison. An English translation was published in 1987. This poem and the process by which it became part of a larger collection offers us all hope for the human spirit and the possibility of rebirth even under the most excruciating circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm 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 seeing light as as well as as dark in these poems. And um, I'm I'm thinking of the line, the more clearly you looked, this beauty that she sees. I'm 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 thinking of that resonated resonating with Marjorie's poem where okay. there's where it's if if if. Okay. Um, okay, so now our last poem by Judith uh, that Judith Carpenter is going to read. Judith Perry Carpenter is the author of two books: Peace Work Quilt meditative poetic offerings for each day of the year and the uninvited goddess a memoir an archetype and an invitation to greater awakening in these troubled times an episcopal priest judith was one of the founders of the former green fire retreat house in tenants harbor she now lives in rockland and seeks to balance family life the contemplative path and a ministry of encouragement with her husband, Jack. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you everyone for participating and being here for this. 
I'm going to begin with a bit about the author and end with the poem um, and just let its relatively simple but meaningful conclusion be our last words today. Viktor Shalkovich was born on February 9th, 1959 in Porozeva near Grodno in the socialist Belarusian Soviet Republic and grew up surrounded by three cultures, the Belarusian, Polish, and Yiddish. He graduated from the State Theater Institute in 1980 and for 11 years was an actor in the Grodno City Theater since 1991, though, he has worked at Grudno Puppet Theater. That's 40 years in puppetry. He's an actor, poet, and bard. Since his school days, he's been writing songs and performing them. Usually, it is said with spontaneity and unpredictability. He's performed in Belarus, Czech Republic, France, Lithuania, Germany, Poland, and Russia and his work has been translated into English, German, Polish, Ukrainian, and Czech. He also played the lead role in a couple of films, and he's been the winner in several different venues of the Grand Prix Film Festival and received many awards for his poetry, songs, and albums. His songs are reported to be very personal, full of sarcasm, irony, and sadness over unfulfilled hopes. But despite their lofty themes, these songs come without pathos. My favorite fact about Viktor Shalkovich is that he won an international award given by children to adults distinguished in their love, care, and aid for children. It's called the Order of the Smile. I tried to discover how things are for Shalkovich at 60, 62 years of age with all the political upheavals going on in Belarus. But I'm sorry to say that I wasn't able to find out anything specifically about him. I will say that I'm struck by the fact that one can know very little about a country, including exactly where it is. And then a situation brings it to your attention and you begin to see it mentioned everywhere. That's happened for me with Belarus because of my choice for today of Shalkovich's poem. I want to tell you what speaks to me the most. And here's the poem. I want to tell you what speaks to me most. My little neighbor, the son of village drunkards, a bright young boy. By the gas lamp, for we have no electricity, he writes each evening a verse about freedom. He is no Rosnai, no Baradlin, <laughs> and certainly he is no Duderai. But I tell you, we will hear of him one day. With these optimistic words, I want to end the difficult evening in our immeasurable Belarus. The end. <laughs> hmm. So we are, <laughs> we, we do, I should probably have a little more silence. We, uh, do end on an optimistic note. And, and I just want to, to say what a wonderful job everyone did. And it's really clear to me, and I'm so grateful for all of the, the time and effort that everyone put into um, reading and understanding the poems and enriching them and presenting them. Um, in, in such a fine way. So it was really terrific. Um, 10 poems, a lot to take in. Uh, one, of, one of the features that I've loved about the uh, Camden Conference Poetry and Cushing sessions in the past 
is the opportunity being in the library for small groups to talk together and reflect on the poems and hear different responses and reactions. Uh, Zoom is a little different, but I, I hope that we will have, that, that people have things to say uh, about the poems and they'll be further, the poems themselves will be even further enriched by responses, general observations that people make, uh, responses to particular poems. If you have questions, um, again, coming back to the Anna Quinlan quote, what affected your heart? What came into your mind? Do you have any new thoughts and new feelings? Um, and one last thing, the title that I gave to this session was uh, New European uh, Poetry, uh, Landscapes of Place, Identity, and Memory. So um, a lot of possibilities. Who'd like to start this next part of the program? <laughs> Oops. Ellen? Yes, Marianne? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm really struck by these. And, and one thing I couldn't get over as I read each one of them before and then heard them read was, my God, I haven't experienced anything. <laughs> I've been so fortunate. I, I haven't been through all of this, but now I know a lot more than I did. And I'm so glad you know, that we had these today. Thanks. Okay, and yeah. that, uh, just Marianne, say 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 your name and where you live. So we'll oh, have- I'm sorry, yeah, I'm Mary, Marianne Boritz and I'm, I live in Cushing. Okay, great, great. And Ellen, I, I was, you know, following up on what Marianne said. Um, I realized that uh, my poet, Ansefsky, had been born a month before I was born in 1954. And I was thinking his life, versus my life or not versus, but just, you know, running, you know, what he went through and the, 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 uh, the independence of, of, uh, of Macedonia and all that, and all of the upheavals and, and the things that the, the challenges in his life. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing to think about the, the contrast between what he's gone through and, and our, and our lives here. And, and just, I mean, just the, the, you know, thinking about the Camden Conference and the challenges in Europe and the, the uh, different countries, plus the, the whole history that they have. I, I think a lot of the, the history comes through in the poem. Thank you, Carl. Judy. I'm curious about- Judy, you wanna introduce uh, yourself? Oh, okay. I'm Judy Bing. I'm another person from Cushing. Um, I'm curious about your selections, Ellen, which definitely um, uh, look toward the Eastern periphery more than the Western periphery of Europe. Uh, and of course, a lot of the travails that have, um, that those particular regions have experienced. I've spent so many years in the Balkans that I know a lot, a lot about those corridors. Mm. Judy? From what we think of in the West. So I'm wondering what led what led your selection toward those places. Well, <laughs> I I had, you know, everything is individual. Uh, I had this book, this anthology, New European Poets, and I realized I was really shocked when this first came up because I've been doing poetry for the Camden Conference for a while that I couldn't name any contemporary European poets. I was not knowledgeable. Um, well, there were two things. I, I, I read the whole book and I was looking for poems that I felt in some way resonated with the theme of the Camden Conference. And so there were many poems I loved, but they were more personal or more intellectual or, or something else. And I also wanted a balance of male and female. So those were two considerations. But I mean, I think when you choose things, there's an intuitive element. So Judy, can you, do you, 
having had all the experience that you had in those countries, is there anything about any one of the poems from there that particularly spoke to oh, you or that would that enrich our understanding? Well, you're you're you're, you're questioning me. <laughs> I'm putting if you if you want to wait and we could go on to someone else and, and come back. And it may be the kind of thing that, that comes to you tomorrow morning. <laughs> well, I know you know I know people who were who were fighting in Bosnia. I read the news now and see that Bosnia is disintegrating once again, even as we speak. And I think about the corridors, the poem that reflected on those corridors and they're very vivid to me because the Balkans are so mountainous that there are indeed corridors of influence that pass across and have led to the, the vulnerabilities as well as the cultural exchanges among those, um, among those, those, those places, excluding, of course, um, Bulgaria and Romania. I mean, depends on how you define the Balkans, but yes. Anyhow, so yes, those poems were particularly vivid to me, I will say. So uh, just this is, so she's talking about the poem, What's Slouching? And in, in the last stanza, it, uh, we have Versailles and tailors and new, new corridors and uh, the change from a well-tuned verse to a stammer. Um, Carl, do you have something to say about that last stanza? Not really. Um, I'd love to hear what somebody else has to say about it. I mean, I think of Versailles, and you know that the 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 rooms full of mirrors and and the you know the confusion and the, the uh, where well turned. And I'm not sure whether he's talking about Yeats again. There, the well tuned verse is reversed to a stammer. But um, yeah. Oh, that's that's an interesting thought. I, I was thinking historically, and I could be completely off. Uh, There's I at the end of World War One, Wayne? When the Balkans were carved up. Yeah. Ah, there you go. That's it. Yeah. And, and perhaps the, the you know, the, the so-called peace treaty of World War One that, that, right. really, uh, that yes. I, led I, to World War Two. Scissored up. <laughs> what, that way? Scissored up, you know, they were. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Gary Van Ring. Yes. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, more, more comments, questions, observations. Uh, Francois? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just seeing the, in all, in many of these poems, this, this, just thinking about memory and how we how we live with it, how we use it in various ways, but in in so much of the so many of the poems we see here, the memory can can be seen as as almost damaging. This this casts a pall across the whole face of Europe for the last hundred, you know, or two thousand years, or how many years you want to consider, right? And so there's this really interesting sort of double edged use of memory, both both to survive and to you know, go through these terrible things, but also that they contribute to the, the, um, the tribalism, the, all of these kinds of issues that we see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where is she? Oh, Ellen. Yes, Kathleen. I want to, I want to piggyback on Francois. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can't remember whose poem it was that had the Mediterranean and, and called it straight. Was it mm -hmm. yours, Wayne? No, no. 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 That, that was Stephen's poem, a Norwegian poet. He's gone, right? He's not no, here. He's here. Stephen's here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, okay. And, and I was thinking that uh, that word straight, of course, has a million different connotations. Um, straight jacket, <laughs> but straight to be in dire strait 
and and really what Francois was saying too is that going back in memory, what stays with you more than anything is is what wounded you or what hurt you or the, the things that you actually uh, form your personality from. Really, it's not necessarily the joyful ones and the family parties, but but the hard ones and the fact that that, that uh, whoever it was. What, I forget whether it was a man or a woman who wrote it, but woman. But used uh, the term "straight" makes perfect sense in that in that way. You know, you got to hold on in the narrow straight, but also you're. It's a life or death situation there. Yeah. That that poem, the the law is the Mediterranean, and and um, Stephen told us she's she's there <laughs> as as well as a poet is on page fourteen. And um, it, it's interesting, the form of, of the poem, it's um, a poem to some extent of instruction. Take long, slow strokes. You're rowing across the strait in one day. Um, but caution too. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, caution. Yeah, and then that's the, those instructions are, are repeated again in the next to the last line. Take long, slow strokes. Um, so, so maybe there's some resonance there also uh, with the question of, of memory and the, the grip of memory. And, but also if we do long, slow strokes, there can be some moving forward. I couldn't help think about refugees here. Yeah. Going across the Mediterranean, but also I thought the strait might have just been the Strait of Gibraltar, mm. which is oh. right, right at sort of at the, the the mouth of the Mediterranean, right? Or isn't it? I don't know. But uh, yeah. that, that so I had that image of them of someone escaping and going across in one day. I also one one of the things that struck me about this poem was in the middle um, the shiny surface of the sea mirrors God, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which um, is not a flattering view of God. Uh, it is and and all three Abrahamic religions can be said to have contributed both to uh, uh, civilization and to its destruction. And when you talk about, you know, Europe, um, it is so much a, mm. uh, it is so much intertwined um, with these three religions. The, the story of Europe, the history of Europe is, is the violence of Europe, um, Europe, unlike Africa or Asia, is by far the scene of the bloodiest, deadliest human conflicts so far. Um, so I, I, do, I do think that th this Europe has this uh, very dark um, lineage that it is always grappling with and living with and trying to break away from but not quite doing it and what's happening in the balkans what's happening in belarus what's happening with immigrants what's happening with right-wing parties um, these are all echoes to various dark chapters in european history uh, yeah, Wayne, let me just say one thing. Something that, that comes through in this poem, I, I think a, a, a general, um, in, in, in general, the, the poems make me think of the complexity of things. And um, towards the end, the law ties you together and keeps you apart. Um, Wayne. There's, there's a, there is this tension between these larger forces that we can't, we, we, we have maybe in, in large sense that we can't shape them and yet they shape us. And, and on the one hand, and so many of the poems are at the personal level of the personal struggle and, and how am I gonna negotiate this? How am I gonna feel about it? How am I gonna feel about my past and my future? Uh, and that's at a, a level at which we live, 
with the larger forces. And and they're and you're right, the larger forces generally aren't very sympathetic in these poems. It's it's I think a, perhaps a certain European sensibility that uh, Americans are maybe slowly painfully <laughs> beginning to think mm -hmm. on as well. Paul, and uh, um, I, would you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, uh, Alan, I'm Paul Strickland. Um, my feet touched the ground in Robinston, Maine, which is far down east. And um, I'm, I'm on the uh, uh, unceded ancestral lands of the Passamaquoddy. And I just have a, um, it, it's not a critique, I don't think, uh, but reflections um, on translations. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that comes up for me, and I, I don't think I agree with Frost, you know, when he said that uh, poetry is what gets lost in translation, but it does give me pause that um, I sometimes, I don't know if I'm drawn to a poet or I'm drawn to a translator because you can have the same poem and different translators take different uh, tacks or uh, perspectives on it. So it's just, um, that's something that, that comes up for me um, with, the, with the translation. And I, it's just something more that I'm sitting with and reflecting on that. And there, I had quite a bit of experience in the, after 32 years in Minnesota, uh, moving there from Texas and then Mississippi. Um, with Robert Bly, and I really like Robert Bly's translations, but what I found was that, you know, there were other people translating the same poem that I really didn't care for that much. So just some reflections. Thank you. James, do you want to speak to that? Is James well, I guess um, one advantage uh, reading translations would be if, if you knew the language uh, that it was the target, the language that was being taken from. Um, that would be helpful. Um, there are many uh, translations now with the original language uh, in Foss. Um, if, if so, that we're looking at translations of a language we don't know, uh, I think we're living in a time now, uh, uh, a, a very fine time where there are many translations uh, of of of, uh, of the same poet, and uh, and there it's just uh, off to the library or um, to find these uh, various possibilities of translation. Um, certainly, the sensibility of the translator uh, enters the translation. Um, the affinity. Uh, for the, the translator for the poet is very important. Um, I think it's been said that only really the best translators of poems are poets. Um, mm. And um, that's because of course, uh, a good translation uh, will follow a literal uh, version of it, uh, perhaps in early versions of it or what we call trot. But especially in translation, you're trying to get at the unspoken, the thing that comes through that the poet is feeling as the translator perceives it, uh, that feeling, the sensations that are, uh, are meant to come from the poem. Um, and and uh, a, a poet can, can perceive that. Uh, in a way that just a, a mere professional translator may not be able to. And, uh, and take some liberty in translation that uh, the translation police will be the first to say, uh, there's nothing like this word in the original. <laughs> and, and yet uh, a native speaker who knows this poet and, knows, uh, and this poem say, the poem uh, is never uh, the gist of the poem, the feeling of the poem is this version captures it. So there are, there are limits, uh, there are outer limits to translation. Uh, it's always the uh, so, so there are 
So it's good to have versions of translations. I guess one of the easiest way, uh, ways is, uh, especially with Robert Bly, for instance, and, uh, and his uh, along with working with the poet James Wright, did some wonderful translations of a very mysterious and marvelous poet, Georg Trakl. Mm. Now, since the, since the time that those translations came out, there have been various uh, books of translations of Trakl's poems. He's a very popular poet and has a, had a lot of influence in American poets. Uh, and there you have an opportunity to just go to the library uh, and and uh, and read the, and read these translations. Now the thing is that I, I don't speak German, but I have a German English dictionary. And so when I sit down with Trakel, I sort of struggle through the German, try and somehow pronounce a little of it, but it's a, I would never attempt to translate Trakel. But there too, you get a sense, little bit of sound, and sound is the poem, the tone, how it's felt. So, in some sense, Frost is absolutely right that poetry really can't be translated because the original language has a tone, a sound, and rhythm that are impossible, of course, to bring over in English. Impossible. So that translation into English has really got to capture something uh, beyond the literal word for word. It's got to be evocative emotionally, uh, uh, as well as capture the intellectual essence of the poem. Mm. So thank, wow. thank you. And, and it, it has, I have thought often that so depending on how different the sound of different languages are it, it may be that some languages translate better into other languages. Um, can I ask you um, in song 352 about the horseradish? Oh, God bless that horseradish. <laughs> well, I think that's exactly what uh, Carl, uh, that's exactly what uh, Ole Lachaya would say, God bless the horseradish. I think. Once we, it's a simple thing. Once we realize that the horseradish is, is a is a root food, right? So uh, it's buried underground. Mm. Uh, and what you have is a dissident poet writing, and uh, he's he's not at home in the in the city. So the poem takes a move from an urban skyscraper, and he's he's out of there. And he, he, as I said earlier, he's mostly at home in the forest. He's a dissident. He wants to get away from those authorities and the socio, uh, the, the, the law, if you will, come back to the law uh, of, of, of authoritarianism. So he's off to the forest uh, and the freedom of the forest. And, um, uh, and there, the hut of the horse radish is, uh, is underground. So truly, in a sense, an underground poem. <laughs> yeah. That's and great. His, his, first, <laughs> but his first work was actually circulated in terms of that, so. Yes. Um, other? Um, yes. Well, I, tried, I wanted to sort of come back to the translation issue a little bit, because when, when you asked me if I would join in, I asked you for a French poet, because I speak French, and that's how I approached this. Um, it, it actually took me a while to get the original and I had to go to Mel Johnson at Fogler Library for him, for him to find it for me. So bless the librarians. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I read the French and, tr and made my own translation before really playing with the, 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 anything else because I felt I would on the only, the only that way could I perhaps get into the poem a little bit. Um, so it was, it was kind of a very interesting process for me to, to approach it that way. Uh, and then I did find issues with uh, Donna Stonecipher's translation here and there that, that maybe I would have done some, some things differently. And uh, maybe the, the most striking one was where she literally translates in that line about the train station, uh, Kalesh, which is a, a, a four-wheeled carriage, you know, horse, horse-drawn carriage. And she, she points that out explicitly. But I felt he was really just using Kalesh as a, an archaic word for 
train carriage. And so I probably wouldn't have gone into the horse business at all. So, um, so it's just, it's just very interesting to, to try to, to, um, to do that if you, if you have the language and, and which is why I asked for French. <laughs> so. Well, I, you know, there, there are, it's so interesting. And the question you raised, Paul, and, and all the comments people are making. Uh, I am grateful, though, for translations, because otherwise, none of, well, maybe, <laughs> I know a little French, but all of the other poems would have been unavailable to me. Yeah, same here. <laughs> so, um, other responses? You know, maybe, maybe one thought. Um, it's not just the translators, it's also the people who are reading it. So I had a reaction, Francois, when you were reading the uh, Souvenir of, of Liège, when you when there was a line about the Rue au Juif, I immediately could focus only very specifically on the street with Jews. So I think the variability of translation is also applies to the variability of how we read it and what it means to us. But in the context of this beautiful, organized, um, wonderful uh, poetry readings, Ellen, that you've created, I, it made me appreciate the deeper view. So I might not have just stayed there based on, you know, that we are reading about so many sadnesses and hardships. So just a thought. Thank you. You were reading French, Francois, I was reading Jewish. <laughs> Um, Karen? Yeah, I just want to say, uh, to follow what the person just before me spoke, yeah, it's it's interesting, uh, the reader. Sorry. I'm being bad at this. It, it, that was Wendy Rappaport, who's oh, okay. in Florida. Okay, and sorry. Can you introduce yourself, Karen? I'm, I'm Karen Lee Nielsen, and uh, she just made me realize that um, the reader is a translator. When you're re if you're reading in your own language, you're translating it. You're giving your impression. Uh, you're you're not, you're you're interpreting it, um, and that and she just made me feel that really uh, really strongly. And I also wanted to say um, that the um, oh I can't remember her name the oh, Judith Carpenter when uh, she read the piece about the, the biography of the of the poet when she read about this poet wrote poems on a piece of soap and then washed herself with it mm -hmm. that that was really powerful and that wasn't the poem but it was a poem in itself it was uh, it was incredible um it was an incredible little touch i'll never forget that i'll never look at a bar of soap the same again so that was that was beautiful and uh, yes, an amazing image. And what what you say about the reader as translator is very interesting, and it calls to mind for me that the translation grows and changes as we read a poem over and over because we see more things. Yes, yes. and at different points in our life, see it differently Excuse as well. Me. Anyone else? Okay, well, last chance. Um, I would like to uh, thank again the, the Camden Conference. I think it's a fine thing that uh, they embrace poetry and the particularly uh, Kim and Lauren and from the Cushing Library, Wendy, despite not feeling well is here with us the whole time. And the readers, you, you just did a, a wonderful job. I knew I was going to learn and grow and have all of the poems enlarged. And in fact, that happened. Uh, it's the 35th anniversary of the Camden Conference this year, and it's taking place February 25th to 27th at the Strom Auditorium. And everyone will hear more about that. Um, and put on your calendars, Sunday, January 30th, another uh, Camden Conference Cushing Library event. I think 
Judy, yeah. Judy had to leave, but she was here. She's the, the person who spent time in, in Eastern Europe. And she and her husband, Brooke, are doing a session, European Architecture Now, Social and Environmental Innovation. And I think some people here have been to their presentations before, and they're excellent. So that's Sunday, January 30th from two to four through the Cushing Library, same process as for this. So um, back to the session and the poems, I, I feel for me uh, a, a stronger relationship with all of the poems. And also I, I wanna read them all again because what happens, I like the way when a number of poems are put together they resonate with and in enlarge and reflect each other and become kind of a, a collage or a tapestry, something larger than the individual poems. Um, so I'm going to return to them and perhaps you will too. And maybe some of the poems you'll want to share with other people. Um, so Coming back to the topic of the conference, Europe challenged at home and abroad. Uh, it's not just Europe that's challenged. <laughs> I know I feel challenged at various times in various ways. And for me, poetry with its singular voice and multiple tones is something that I turn to. Mm. So again, Thank you to everybody for a very enriching afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Good to see everyone. Take care. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm Wendy, I'm still here. And I just wanna say thank you to Ellen for putting this amazing program together. I very much enjoyed it as I hid in the back room and coughed. So oh, thank you very, very much, Ellen. It was, it's it's Really my pleasure. It was wonderful. All right, everyone, have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you at the end of December for the architecture program. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.